happy that you have mentioned your own exhibition at Galerie de Lucan, which was a very interesting one. I'd like to say thank you to James Patton for this for, for having accepting uh, this touring exhibition with uh, video artists from Montreal that we have uh, circulated in many, many places, interesting places since a couple of years uh, from uh, Europe to the US and to other places in Canada and it's not finished because after here it will go to Bishop University, it will go to the Mori Art Museum in Tokyo and probably in Head, Genève, which is Haute, uh, Hautes Études d'Art et de Design, Head. It's a, it's a kind of university art gallery also. Uh, and I'd like to thank the students who have, I have been lucky enough to uh, visit this afternoon uh, in a very interesting conversation with four of the students here. So it's, it's Enrich, the curator who I try to stay even if I am also a director, but at the base I am an art historian. I would say an art historian of when art is shown, not an art historian working with documentation. I, it's very important for me. We would say in French, un historien de l'art exposé, not only an historien de l'art. So when we look at the artwork in its condition of exhibition, which bring a lot of knowledge according to me. So studio visits are sometimes occasion for people like me to enter <coughs> in uh, new uh, uh, experimentations that uh, the new generation of artists is, uh, is doing. So uh, yes, I'll try to talk, I, you know, I was not really familiar with, uh, with uh, who would be uh, the people tonight. So I want to talk a bit about video zoom just to explain the context of this project, why I planned this project with uh, uh, two young colleagues. Uh, I'll also focus on what is typical of the artist at university uh, and the art historian and, and the one who is uh, specialized in uh, curatorial studies. And it has something to see with knowledge, but I'd, I'd like to uh, bring the paradigm of a society which has uh, put a lot of uh, uh, effort and support and money and university programs in developing professional uh, skills and high level of, uh, of a performance uh, on a side and on the other side with letting the culture of entertainment enter into, into our field and creating a kind of opposition uh, instead of connection between uh, the level of uh, what an artist at university is doing and what we're expecting from him or her and what we are giving to the society in another uh, side when we focus almost only on a quick culture, very fast culture, fast, fast culture of, uh, of uh, entertainment. I will uh, tell you a bit more about that. And I will try to privilege all over these concerns, the link between the artist and the curator and the choice that we are doing as an artist or as a curator in the level which is linked to the university research standard and things like that, or on the other side, the culture of uh, entertainment, if you pre privilege this, uh, this path for you as an artist or as a curator. Um, so video zoom, uh, I'll start with a few images, but you will see them, it's, they, they are video stills. You will see uh, Jacinthe Carrier in, in the exhibition program. So this is something uh, uh, which was uh, at the beginning linked to the fact that I was seeing in Quebec a generation of artists working a lot with moving image. Um, I was uh, 
lucky enough to have access to very own work uh, from you know master program students or very young new professional artists uh, trying to engage in a professional practice of their art. Uh, so I've uh, approached with my young colleagues uh, the idea that we would uh, bring some attention to uh, something which was closer to experiment than to artwork, finished, completed artwork. Uh, and we put the artists we have invited in a situation where they could create something new, uh, especially because we gave them a constraint which was nothing more than four minutes. It was a kind of exercise, like we are doing exercise at school, and uh, for some of them, with uh, certain bagage, like Pascal Grandmaison uh, is already established. He, had, he has had uh, exhibition at the National Gallery in Ottawa, the Musée d'Art Contemporain in Montreal, in Europe. He has a catalog, uh, you know, like that, very important one. But he was submitted to the same constraint than the younger uh, artist who uh, have accepted to be part of that project. There's seven artists in, in the exhibition. Um, so uh, more project, more tries, you know, more experimental thing than you know, to make a choice of a certain work already done, already successful, that we package in a program. It was not the goal. Is it OK you understand me? No need for a microphone? It's OK? It will not correct my accent, I've been told. So. <laughs> um, yeah, and some of these, uh, among the seven artists we've chosen, were just finishing their degree uh, in the master program. And we had an opportunity to put this project together because Montreal and Brooklyn has, uh, developed, have developed, because of certain individuals, uh, interest in collaborating, a project called Montreal B Brooklyn. So I've been approached by this group of, uh, of people and at the end there was something like 12 or 13 institutions who have collaborated. So we have shown the Brooklyn, Brooklynois artist in Montreal and we did the same in Brooklyn in various institutions. And I, the first thing I said is, no crave, no customs, no things so difficult with the US after 9-11. Uh, I don't know if you realize how much a political, you probably realize how much a politi uh, um, uh, situation like 9-11 in New York has, uh, uh, has had as an impact on the cost, on the, the control at the customs, and, and so on. So it, uh, it also explains, or often explains, why Canada and the US are not connecting so well in exchanging exhibition. And if you have uh, the solution, or the, you know the miracle, just tell me, because for me, it's, it's not a question of language. We're one hour by, by flight from New York, as you are, probably. So there's no reason we would not connect more, but sometimes, you know, money and practical questions are big obstacles. So I said, okay, not that kind of thing. I said, I'm thinking about uh, showing a video, but not as it is done in movies or uh, film festival or to show them in the context of an exhibition, as uh, exhibition, for four, five, six weeks, instead of for a weekend, for example. So the, the, these were my concerns at that time. And also, uh, I started the program the year Mr. Hopper, you know who is Mr. Hopper, just turned down almost all the grants we could apply to circulate exhibitions outside Canada. So it has been terrible for us, and I just said, Mr. Hopper, you will not uh, stop me <laughs> to, uh, to do my work and to uh, develop some networks for artists and works of art I believe in. Uh, I'll find a way to be the most efficient I can be without your program. And this is, uh, I think that video zoom 
because now we are working on a second series. Video Zoom will have been shown in 12 venues when we will finish. So I'm pretty happy with the, with the result. Even if it's not a solution, we still need these, uh, these grants to circulate uh, the work of Canadian artists, especially that we are always complaining about the fact that it is difficult to, to find some, uh, I don't want to use the word market, so the network uh, outside Canada. It's expensive, it's complicated, we're not known. We, we have lost our exotism many decennies ago. You know, what can you do when the first page of Art Press is Art Contemporain au Tibet? How could you recover your exotisms when you compete with uh, China, with Vietnam, Tibet, South America, and in the close past it was with the Balkans? And so it's very difficult for us to be interesting. Uh, outside, so we still need that money to uh, improve and increase the way we can um, show the, the artists outside. And also, uh, I was uh, just I just founded that same year, three three four years ago, uh, a collective, a curatorial collective uh, called La Fabrique d'Exposition. And I did this with two of my uh, old students. Um, they, they were my students in curatorial study program at the master, for the master. They did their interns at Galerie de Lucas, amongst others. They were the best. So I've tried to keep them. I taught them how to apply for grants for the gallery, saying if we have the money, you have a job. We've been successful, so now I my two main collaborators, Audrey and Julie, uh, are working on the same level than myself. And, and sometimes because we have more experience and more, uh, we're older and all these things, you know, we, we are known, we are a crutch for a lot of things and sometimes I was not able to say yes to very interesting proposals. So I thought that with two young uh, collaborators, uh, we could, working together, say yes to more occasions to, uh, to do some projects because this is what we like to do the most in, 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 in our job. So working, the three of us, uh, we have established this, the fact that we would try to develop different projects than what we used to do at the Galerie de Lucas and we have started this uh, selection of uh, the, this project video zoom that you will see. And uh, I'm adding the fact that for a moment I was dealing between video zoom and video zone. Uh, and finally I found uh, some uh, idea that zoom was when you were focusing on only one place, like what you will see here. But when we did the project with Brooklyn, we have matched both programs because we've worked with a colleague in uh, Brooklyn who made the selection for six, seven artists from Brooklyn because we, we were not familiar with the scene. So the Fabrique d'Exposition is also with variable scale because we are inviting colleagues just to bring other kind of expertise that we don't have. So when we match with another city and we'll do it with Genève, in Switzerland next year. So we call it zone, video zone, because we bring together uh, the connection between two cities or two countries. And when we focus on something, it's video zone. You have all the story of video zone, so now you can see the work. Um, yeah, so we're supposed to think it's, it's, it's still Jacinthe Carrier, but I don't want to say too much about uh, the program, there's a wall text, I guess it's it's the text which will give you some keys uh, to enter into the project. Let's think about what we're doing in a university when you're studying art or creatorial studies. I'm showing this fantastic work by Sherry Boyle, Our Ancestors Concerned. Uh, we will not go back to art historians of the 18th century, I promise. But sometimes we have to establish or re-establish where we are from. 
Uh, I read something very brief for you. Um, uni universities are not anymore those <coughs> closed world reserved to the elite and concentrated on abstract topics and domains. They are becoming a more open system based on your relationship involving many sectors of human activities and responsibilities. Intellectuals, business people, public personalities, professionals, and students are linked in ways they were not before. Another definition. Museum institutions are not anymore those closed world reserved to the elite and dedicated to sophisticated and complicated artwork works. They are becoming a more open system based on new relationships involving many sectors of human activities and responsibilities. Intellectuals, business people, public personalities, professionals, senior citizens, and students are linked in ways they were not before. The university gallery is combining those, those two worlds. It is probably why, why, why they are playing a more important role on the chessboard of art. James, it's for you. <laughs> when we are director of university art galleries, we need that kind of food to be sure that we, uh, we are essential. We always have to uh, establish how much we are essential. <coughs> but anyway, on the chessboard of art, this role now open to the most important realizations such as collecting intensely, ensuring the development of new currents and new generation of artists, being mandated to represent the country to international events, etc., etc. So uh, the university art galleries are at this uh, in intersection of universities and museums. And if we go back to what our uh, ancestors <laughs> were doing, you know that the museums have ap appeared first in universities. So we are taken together, and the re reason uh, why. Uh, in the 60s, maybe before in some part of Canada, I'm not sure, but in the 50s, 60s uh, in Quebec, uh, we have uh, seen this important movement where the School of Arts have been closed and the teaching of art has been transferred under the responsibility of the university. This is very important because it makes a view intellectuals, it makes a view people of knowledge, and uh, we assist to a kind of change between uh, savoir faire, how to do the things, and savoir penser, how to think about what we're doing. And it is very interesting to, to see that it, that it appears in North America, but not in Europe, not in all the countries in Europe. For example, in France, they still have School of Arts. Uh, in the universities where there's teaching art, they don't really have serious, high-profile university galleries like we used to have here. So we are, uh, we have this heritage from Europe, uh, Quebec, I mean, uh, in different ways, but we are in the North America axis if we look at what the university galleries are doing. So we see the artist as potentially an intellectual, uh, someone who will like or will learn how to think, how to experiment, how to develop concept. Uh, this is uh, the result of maybe the conceptual art or Monsieur Duchamp or uh, the idea of uh, art as idea or uh, the artist as an essayist. I don't know if you understand the word in English, and I don't know the word in English. An essayist. Essay. Essay. Who is doing? Yeah, fifty percent of the time it's the same word, but anyway. Um, so and 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 so we are in this double trend: being together in a university and attached to a university art gallery, 
So the artist is seen as an, an intellectual, someone who can write, express the meaning of his practice in terms of concept, research, protocol of experimentation. He is a certain witness of the world, but and he has responsibilities to the world as intellectuals used to have, but the inscription of his work is done in a different way in producing visual artworks. On the, the other trend is the art historian is now uh, detached sometimes from the art history per se to become um, uh, an exhibition maker um, with uh, the process of the exhibition as involving a part of knowledge coming from art history, but also producing art history. For years, these art historians were looking at an artwork and were trying to understand it. We still have some problem to understand, for example, Les Menin, Velasquez. There's books and books and books, and we, after 400 years, we're still not sure that we understand that painting. It's amazing. But since a couple of decennies, few decennies, we look at the work in this condition of the exhibition, in the way it encounters with other works of art, in the way we are facing these artworks, in the way we are trying to tell another kind of story, which is exhibition. So combining this um, background in art history and a certain ability to develop, for example, a scenography, to interpret some artworks, to provoke or produce other kind of conversations uh, with, between the artworks, this is what the curator is, is doing in a very close connection to the artist when he's alive and when not in experimenting a kind of fictional conversation with the artist. Um, there's no uh, way to um, not consider the fact that if you are looking at um, paintings uh, of, uh, it's, let's say, Zurbaran, I find he's one of the most famous contemporary painter, but he was working in the 16th century. If we look at these paintings today, it's contemporary art. So it's a contemporary engagement through the artwork. So the curators working with old masters' uh, work is uh, bringing them into the prison. It's not him going back in the past, according to me. So the University Art Gallery benefits from uh, the artist uh, being in house as a student, graduate student, a teacher, artist teacher, and benefits from the um, cur curator who is learning through these new fields, curatorial studies, museum studies, that, that this double expertise, uh, uh, and it's for the best, and it's one of the characteristics of uh, having the artist and these, the specialists around the artist into the university. Um, yeah, so I make proof of that. I show you some project we did at Galerie de Lucan very briefly. So Sherry Ball, I, I was a curator of uh, one of her, I must say, important exhibition in, ta in, in terms of size because we have covered uh, 10 years of his work. We produced the first catalog uh, on, on, on her work. She's from Toronto, probably you know the work. You can find it on the web uh, if, if you do not. Uh, she is that kind of artist. I used to say, and I told to the artists I've seen this afternoon, I never uh, use the word uh, painter, paintings, uh, sculptors, sculptors. I just say artist and artworks. And so because she's working with drawing, painting, sculpture, light, porcelains, textiles, and, and so on, uh, I, I would not be able to say who is she exactly, except that she's an artist. Sometimes the, the, the artists have started very young at the Galerie de Lucan. This is one of the pieces David Altmed has shown in the uh, uh, um, 
undergraduate exhibition at the end of the program. He was already working with Fate, Fate Air. Uh, he was almost uh, working with the werewolf, which has been his signature. So you can see here the first werewolves he did in his career at the end of uh, 90, the 90s, 98, 99. We showed them at the Galerie de Lucam in a group show uh, in 99. Um, and so you have the first uh, werewolf number one, werewolf number two. And I told the artist, he was a student at that time, I was not the director at the Galerie, but I was visiting exhibitions of undergraduate uh, students uh, at Galerie de Lucan. Uh, so when I arrived at the gallery a couple of years after that, I was interested uh, with the idea to do a group exhibition with very recent graduate students. Um, and he was part of that. And I told him, please never sell the werewolf number one, because it's the first work he has produced as you know, a student becoming a professional artist, just in the transition of that. And I said, one day you will give this piece to your institution. So now it's in the Galerie de Lucam collection, evidently. <laughs> but uh, for me, it was very important to keep uh, a piece which was um, expressing this idea of a transition expressing the uh, establishment of, uh, of a path, of a signature, we would say, uh, a style, which is a word that we never use, but uh, you know, it's typical of the development works. And so this is another head. And I don't know how much you're familiar with him, but now you see the name, so maybe you will write it, and you will do what I did when I saw his piece the first time, because I knew I would never remember the name, so I wrote it, and I can tell you what it means so you can remind it. It means old maid. It's old Yiddish crossed with Netherlands, Rotterdam, grandparents, and, but it means old maid. So it's easier to remember that way. So I'm very ped pedagogic, n'est-ce pas? <laughs> <laughs> so this is the big platforms that he has started to produce, you know when? when he has been able to get access to more space. Because all the pieces he did uh, before was linked to the distance between the bed and the wall. So these boxes with the first werewolves were, are approximati approximately four feet, five feet. He was not able to do more because he was living in a very small apartment uh, in New York studying at Columbia. But at the moment, he's been able to get access to some space, and he started to do larger platforms. In fact, he put the little platforms he used to, to do on a larger one. And it was also a way to start a certain pro protocol to how he would show his sculptures. And he has started to connect with a lot of little details and golden chains and flowers and leaves, all the pieces together, just to be sure that the energy could circulate between all the parts. And he produced this first big giant, it's 12 feet high. Uh, the year before, we did the Vedis Bainal together uh, in the Canadian Pavilion, which was in 2007. So you can see some details, he's using the body as a kind of architecture, putting some staircases in, inside, uh, working in, in, in inside the body, and uh, yeah. So you will find a lot on the internet, so I will not say more about David Altman. Michel De Bruin is another uh, artist that we have shown at the gallery before he was uh, uh, known as much as he is now. But uh, we just in installed the exhibition and opened it, and he won the Sobi Award the day of our opening. And it was very funny because the director of the Musée d'Art Contemporain 
who knew almost nothing about him, just ran to the gallery when he got the news. And at 7.45, he was at the gallery to buy something for the collection because, as we see, they were missing the train. They have not seen, at that point, how much the artist was uh, establishing his, uh, his work and was uh, having recognition outside Montreal. Raphael de Groot, uh, you probably also the name, she did this project in 2006 at the Galerie de, 2005 at the Galerie de Lucam. It was her exhibition for the, uh, her master uh, program. Uh, and uh, she, she, it was amazing because the title of the exhibition is En Exercice, so Raphael de Groot exercising, exercising herself. So she had uh, to learn how to, uh, to be suspended from the ceiling. She worked with someone from Cirque du Soleil because at the point she's upside down, hanging by her feet, and she is putting herself in a very difficult and challenging situation. Uh, it's, it's the main aspect of her work. I don't want to summarize too much, but she is putting herself as an artist in difficult situation to push the limits of the, of the artist. And, and here, <laughs> this is her on a gondola. This is the, a project that I have curated with her last year at the Venice Biennale. I have asked her to perform, I have asked her if she was interested in performing on the gondola, reminding uh, these, uh, these uh, periods of, the, of Venice with uh, parades and cortege and, and religious cortege and, and also with the doge and you know, with all these velvet cape and, and mask and things like that. So she did that, she transformed herself, she blinded herself, putting so much paper and thing around her face. So she was not seeing, and she was standing up on the gondola in a kind of very difficult equilibrium, you know, uh, challenging herself in that way uh, until, you know, she did that for three hours on the Grand Canal. And, so it was very exciting because, you know, at university, the financial service, they were very surprised that they had to pay $700 for a gondola, a gondolier, a gondola driver. <laughs> so this is the kind of funny situation we, we, we face sometimes. What I'm showing is, uh, I have two images, uh, David Spriggs, um, a young artist at that time, younger, maybe it's five, six years ago. So he did this uh, very impressive uh, structure with uh, almost 800 sheets of this acetate, you know, transparent. It's painted on each of them and it's hanged. Uh, it's super, su su superposé in a way that you, you see the painting as light and you see some shape behind. And sometimes it's very political scenes or very uh, figurative and, and complicated things. But when you enter in the gallery, it looks like only green light. And uh, so it was the first time we invite uh, an artist as a, uh, in a residence at Galerie de Lucas. Now we do it each two years. We alternate September. One year, it's Moi de la Photo. We have uh, an important photo biennale in Montreal. And the year after, it's an artist who has the space during the summertime, so he can install something complicated and long to install. Sometimes it's produced in the gallery. So we give the space as a studio, a huge studio, where the artist or student or can experiment the size, the technical questions. And so we do that and we open in September uh, when it's ready. Patrick Bernatchez, I'm just giving you some names. I, mean, I don't know how much you're familiar with the Montreal scene or Quebec scene, but they are shown also in, uh, in Toronto because some of them have galleries in Toronto. Patrick is with Diaz Contemporary, for example. And so he just has an exhibition. He has 
uh, at that moment. An exhibition at Casino Luxembourg, which is a, a fantastic uh, work. It's There's music, there's poetry, there's uh, um, uh, kind of uh, imaginary, which is bringing an image of a cinema, which look a hundred years ago, and it's linked to uh, very uh, actual concerns, so he's a very good artist. So we did the big uh, solo exhibition. Uh, Christophe has mentioned that we are publishing, we try to publish, we have tried to publish a lot. And so one of uh, our goal is to produce monography for mid-career artists or, you know, younger in the process to become more mature artists and sometimes they don't have anything, they have only small brochures, so we produce a big book. The book is almost a kind of retrospective for 12, 15, sometimes more years, uh, but the exhibition is a perspective, so we, we do the difference. We only show very, very contemporary art at the Galerie de Lucan. This is Manon de Pau, and I think it's the last one photo, video, video installation, and something very interesting, photogram, photograms. Uh, you know, these kind of images which appear uh, under the light, but not through a uh, camera uh, photo. You know that. Okay, so this is not an artwork. I'll just go through uh, this kind of new paradigm I was talking about, and I go to the conclusion it will be fast. It's what is a kind of, what I see as a perturbation, perturbation of, uh, of the moment now. This is, which is because there's, uh, since 20, 30 years, there's these new givens about the money that the museums and art galleries are obliged to find, and which bring them closer to the market question when uh, the, muse, the art gallery is selling, not as a place of knowledge, but as a place for entertainment. Um, it's not like that all the time, but if you look around, I'm sure you have ideas in mind. You know, when we see Snoopy at the Montreal Museum of Fine Arts, or Pierre Cardin, who was a bad designer, fashion designer, or when you see, um, let's uh, cars, beauté mobile, which is such a ridiculous title, you know, beauté mobile, uh, and you see uh, 50 cars in a museum, and 30 of them, you can see them in garage where they have Lamborghinis and things like that, you know. There's only uh, 15 of the cars who are from collection because they are Bugattis of the 20s and 30s. So at the point it, ar it arrives in a museum with this idea that it will catch some money uh, with such a business-oriented uh, project. And in fact, almost all the big uh, deficits that the museums have done in the last 20, 30 years were due to these projects who were supposed to bring money for research. But the word research in museums and big art galleries, we listen, we hear that mainly for money and public, not about art, it's really about art. Anyway, uh, we, f we, we live now with the kind of uh, impact or con consequence of that problem with money uh, we valorize now people giving money to the institution, and, and we are increasing, uh, during that time we are increasing the skills of the curator at university with PhD programs and, and things like that. On the other side, we are giving to some art collectors a big power in the institution. And, um, and sometimes we go further because we hire people who are not curators. I, I used to say that there is professional curators and I belong <coughs> to that category. And there is commissaire d'agrément. This is very difficult to translate. It's commissaire just to enjoy, <laughs> just to enjoy yourself. So for example, there is an exhibition of David Altmed in Paris right now, Musée d'art moderne de la ville de Paris, one of the biggest museums you know, 
in Paris, but the curator is a collector and a chef in a restaurant. And so when he's been invited, he called me saying, would you help me because I don't know how to be a curator and I, I cannot write. So we are seeing more and more, he's a very nice uh, person and a very good chef. <laughs> but, you know, I am the curator. I, I think this example, because it's very close, uh, I was there uh, three or four weeks ago, but it happened. I've heard that Isabelle Huppert, the actress, would curate a show somewhere in Paris in a few months. So, and I saw that Kent Nagano, our maestro for the Orchestre Symphonique, the Symphony Orchestra in Montreal, he had uh, played with a part of the collection of Loto Quebec uh, two, three years ago to establish a scenography, you know, working in a maquette. was so fun. Placing the paintings and the drawings. So we asked celebrities to do that uh, because uh, we need their, their uh, recognition, we need uh, the public, we need the audience, we need the money, and we need to be connected to uh, famous people. So it's the age of Hollywoodization, mm, I got it, uh, of visual arts, and it's always also the age of uh, the, the le commentaire. We don't talk about critic, but we comment a lot. We exchange words, but we don't go very deep. So the young artists are facing two roads, according to me. One is that. This is a photo of the six participants in a télé-réalité show on the television in Quebec called Les Contemporains. It's about how to become successful as an artist. So you have some challenges, you have critics, you have mentors, uh, someone say, it's very bad, don't do that. So she cries, and uh, she's the bad one of the group, and there's, there's always a nice guy, and there's the bitch, and there's, you know, it's typical, typically a reality, tele-reality program. It's on television right now, on the web you can find, and so for me it's horrifying, but this is one of the paths, so you can make that choice. You will be connected to collectors, you will go into the happy hours, you will drink nice wine, and we, you will be bought by collectors. The other way <laughs> is, uh, they would kill me. No, I will go through William Burrow and Patti Smith. Look at on the side of Patti Smith gi giving advice to young artists, if you are a young artist. Uh, so the, there's also um, new, a, a new path for curators. We, we could be a curator very à la mode and working with this trend of uh, entertainment or we can keep a certain level of, uh, of uh, work, especially when we engage the conversation for a solo exhibition with one individual. Because group shows in the world, if you look around, Documenta or Venice Bienal and all these big, big events, they have curators who are stars and they are developing ideas and everybody is, look, is happy and half of the piece are sold before it opens because the collectors are running after the star curator. And you know, we are living in that situation. So I was, uh, intending to yeah to just express the fact that we are in this bold world but being in a university having the chance to see projects in the university art gallery and to develop your skills with teachers and artists uh, it's it's something which has to be considered according to Graham Patterson at Galerie de Lucam right now you know him he was in Hamilton uh, a few months ago, this is the Galerie de Lucan. Jean-Pierre Aubé, we're doing a project in Venice next year. He's doing landscapes of the uh, radi radio frequencies over the cities. We'll go to do the uh, spectre, the, the radio frequency over Venice. It's kind of sound, it's landscape of Venice. And I'm ending with Aude Moreau uh, that you will see in um, the video zoom, it's a view of Montreal, 
It's the stock exchange tower, and it's written on the last, highest level, sortir, which means to entertain. Sortir, we, 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 nous sortons dans les clubs, nous sortons au restaurant. So entertaining is, is, is the key. Voilà. Thank <laughs> you.